In this video, we're going to discuss the topic of speciation. And we're going to split this into two different video segments because there's actually quite a lot of information here that we're going to cover. Um, and speciation is really what we're looking at is what makes or defines a species? What separates or distinguishes one group of organisms from another? And, and what, what classifies that? And that, those are the topics that we're going to kind of look at and explore in this video and the second part of the video. Um, so the first question is what is a species? Here in our picture we've got quite a few different species. These are probably pretty easily recognizable as different species. Uh, the only ones that maybe overlap or be very closely related would be border collie and the wolf. Um, very very closely related, um, Very have quite a few similarities between their physical um, and behavioral f characteristics and traits. Uh, fish, birds, um, this is a type of uh, sea slug, um, uh, an elephant, obviously all very different species. Um, and we can tell that by their appearance. For, and for a long time, that's how humans classified different organisms was based off of their physical characteristics, things that we could see, or their behavioral characteristics to identify what makes a species. But now that we're able to actually sequence DNA and to look at an organism's DNA, we've been able to determine um, that some organisms that we thought were not very closely related are much more closely related than we originally intended or, or what we originally thought. Um, and, and so to distinguish what makes a species, we can look at dogs, for example. Um, dogs we usually classify as different breeds. Um, we've got a German Shepherd here, a Collie, uh, this looks like a Chow, Poodle, um, uh, Bulldog. Uh, all of these would be different types of breeds of dogs. But the question is, are these a different species? Are these different species? And so then that really gets at the question, what is or what makes a species? And we're going to come back to this uh, example of the dogs, but really what makes a species? Um, and a good definition for identifying a species is a group of organisms of common ancestry that closely resemble each other structurally and biochemically, which would be referring to their DNA, which are members of natural population that do, that do or potentially breed with one another to produce fertile offspring. Now that kind of seems like a lot here, um, and we can break this down a little bit further to make it a little bit more simple and refer back to our, our dogs uh, in, in terms of different breeds. To The portion that we want to focus on here is this right here, potentially breed with one another to produce fertile offspring. And this, this portion of fertile offspring is really important because sometimes, and, and we, we'll talk about some examples, organisms can reproduce, but if their offspring are not fertile, meaning if they're not able to reproduce, it doesn't really mean anything. That, that organism that's, that's produced is not gonna be able to pass on its genes until it's not fertile. And so that's really one of the key ways to distinguish between two different species is can they reproduce and produce fertile offspring? Now, as we mentioned before, uh, as I mentioned before, DNA testing has, has become a more standard approach to identifying different species by sequencing the DNA of the, of the organism. We can determine how related they are um, in terms of their DNA code. Uh, but let's go back to our, uh, our example of the dogs of uh, different breeds. Now, uh, the German Shepherd and the Collie could most likely, uh, in most situations, they would could breed with one another and produce fertile reproducing offspring. A lot of times this mix of different, uh, different breeds is what we would call uh, a mutt or a mix. It's just a, a, a dog that has a number of different um, types of breeds. Uh, the DNA is composed of different types of breeds. But if you were to think of this uh, on terms of a large dog, maybe like a really large German Shepherd, uh, breeding with a Chihuahua or a uh, Pomeranian, a very small dog, um, <laughs> the physical aspect of this uh, occurring is, is probably going to be pretty difficult. And that is actually one barrier to, um, to eventually produce two different species, is the inability to reproduce physically. Um, now, if, if sperm and egg were to be extracted from a, a big German Shepherd and a really tiny little Chihuahua and mixed together in the lab, yes, they could produce fertile offspring. But physically, in nature, and, and naturally occurring, a big German Shepherd reproducing with a little Chihuahua is probably not going to happen. But because different dog species, uh, different dog breeds, excuse me, can still reproduce, uh, they're not technically different species. 
Um, as we move forward with this, we want to identify a couple of different topics. And the first is what we refer to as a gene pool. We want to define a few, a few different terms here. And a gene pool is a combination of all the genes or genetic information within a specific area population of a single species. So we're looking at all of the different genes that are in a particular area for a population. The allele frequency then is the frequency at, at which each of those different alleles occur within the gene pool of a population. And as you saw in our Hardy Weinberg video and the demonstrations and activities we did in class, we can actually calculate this and use this as a means uh, to see if the allele frequency is changing, to see if that population is actually evolving or changing. Now, when we're looking at or talking about gene pools, um, there can be barriers that uh, block movement uh, of genes between gene pools. Um, and the first would be geographical isolation. Uh, so geographical features, and the most common would be like uh, a lake or a river or maybe a mountain range, they can actually block the ability of, of organisms, uh, individuals of the same species to mix and to be able to reproduce. And so the first one, geographical isolation, um, here's an example from, from UC Berkeley's website. Um, say there's a population of beetles, uh, for, for some reason there's an environmental change that causes a river to cut that population into two. We have two different uh, separated populations where there's no gene flow. There's not genes being tr passed back and forth, meaning that they're not reproducing with one another. So these are two isolated populations. And because those are two different locations, two different populations, um, there's variation in those populations, and there's going to be different selec selective pressures on those populations. Over time, those two populations can change, can adapt to their environments, uh, so that they are different and they become different species. We've actually seen this as a real example um, in real life in different salamanders um, moving down the, the coast of California. Um, ancestral population moving down from Oregon, uh, Northern California, the mountain range, um, Sierras splitting California, um, basically blocked or, or kept these salamanders from um, uh, reproducing. Uh, with one another. So some of these are going down the, through the coast, some of them are going on the eastern edge, more inland. Um, and uh, through their migration and um, uh, adaptations uh, to the different environments uh, as they're moving south uh, through California, um, by the time they've re-met, um, they've uh, changed so much over, over many years um, that they've essentially become two different species. Uh, we'll look at a video in class that, that highlights this and explains this even further. But this is an example of geographical isolation. There's some geographical feature, whether it's a stream or a river, or maybe an ocean, a lake, uh, or a mountain range that are separating these two different, uh, two different groups. The second is hybrid infertility. And this is the inability um, of two different organisms to reproduce and have offspring that are, that are able to reproduce or are fertile. And a great example of this is the ligram, where there's a female um, tiger and a male lion reproduce, and they produce something called a liger, if you've seen Napoleon Dynamite. Um, ligers are not able to reproduce. Um, they're actually extremely large animals. Uh, they're much larger than a lion or tiger. Um, and they're very rare, but they, they do exist. Um, but they're infertile, meaning that they're not able to reproduce. Um, Another example is going to be then the mule, uh, which is the cross of a donkey and a horse. And so because um, a horse and a donkey can reproduce to, to create a mule, um, that mule is infertile. Um, and so this is hybrid infertility. The next barrier between gene pools that we're going to take a look at is temporal isolation. And temporal, temporal is referring to time. And so in this situation, we're talking about the timing of reproduction. And here we have three different uh, species. And each one of these species is reproducing at slightly different times. And so you can see here, this one is February, March predominantly. This one, um, April uh, to May. And then the, the first one here is September to, to really November. And so because they're reproducing or their reproductive habits are at different times, um, they're not able to reproduce with one another. And so this is a barrier between uh, these different species and transferring genes between them. The last one that we're going to look at is behavioral isolation. And a great example of that 
um, are, are in different, some different bird species. And this is really the behavior that these birds exhibit. Uh, in mating rituals, this is very common. Um, in this example, these birds have a pointing display of how they uh, try to attract mates. And then in this example, they have a courting dance. And so they have different behaviors um, of how they're going to attract mates, which, which is a barrier um, for genes uh, to be passed between these different groups or different, different um, populations. The next topic we're going to look at is transient polymorphism. And polymorphism is two or more clearly different phenotypes existing in a species population. Two clearly different phenotypes existing within a species population. Transient means changing and lasting only for a short time. So if we put those together, it means a change that may be gradual from one phenotype or phenotypes to another. And so we're going to take a look at a couple of examples to finish up this first video of speciation. Um, in the 1840s, or prior to the 1840s, um, moths uh, in England um, tended to, to blend in with their environment. And uh, here's a, a tree here, um, and you can see the dark moth, and here's a, a lighter colored moth. And the light, lighter colored moth blends in pretty well. Well, um, during the Industrial Revolution, um, in which um, factories were being produced uh, in England um, in order to produce supplies and, and to produce goods, um, all of the soot that, uh, from coal that was being burnt um, during the, that time uh, changed the environment. And so originally, environment looks like this. A, a dark moth on the, the lighter tree is really going to stick out. And so if you're a bird, you're going to be able to see that really easily and eat um, and eat this darker moth, whereas the lighter colored moth is pretty difficult to see. Uh, it's really difficult to see. Well, in 18, the late 1840s, 1848, um, and, and all the way up into the beginning of the 1900s, all these factories producing uh, soot and acid rain from burning coal changed the environment. And so this deposit of soot went from um, changing the tree colors from kind of a white natural bark color to this really dark color. Um, birds are obviously, and owls and, and different predators are going to pick off and to eat whatever they can see and find the easiest. And so by this changing environment, the dark moths were able to blend in with their environment better than the light moths. And so this actually caused a change in um, the population of, um, of, of these different moth species. Um, and this is a form of selection called directional selection in which the one form of the trait, uh, particularly the dark one, was more favorable or fit in the environment than the lighter color. And because of this environmental change um, that these moths, uh, the environment that these moths lived in, it caused a change in overall their allele frequency and caused the population to change. And we've been able to, uh, scientists have been able to recreate and kind of uh, reproduce these same results um, in experimental labs and simulations uh, in which um, the uh, polluted habitat, the darker alleles uh, for moth color are uh, more prevalent, um, whereas in the unpolluted habitat, the lighter moth. We're going to finish by discussing uh, balanced transient polymorphism, specifically through sickle cell anemia. And what happens with this disorder is valine is produced um, instead of uh, an acid. And what this does is it causes a mutant variety of hemoglobin. Um, and it causes red blood cells to have this kind of odd sickle cell shape. Uh, they carry less oxygen, and they have the potential to actually get stuck in capillaries. They can cause a little jam here like this, and it's very painful, can be very painful, and it can cause potential strokes. The unfortunate portion uh, of this is that recessive, uh, those who have two recessive alleles can actually die from having this disorder. Um, through potential strokes. But however, we tend to see a large number of the sickle cell allele, the recessive alleles, present in regions um, near the equator. And that, the, in those regions actually are pertained to where there's a um, large number of cases of malaria. And so what we've found is that um, the sickle cell allele being a carrier for that allele actually helps individuals to survive in regions where there's lots of malaria, like uh, these regions in Africa near the equator. So this results in balanced polymorphism in which the heterozygous phenotype is maintained actually in the poly, in the population. Um, a quick a pedigree here, a Punnett square shows us that uh, normal, um, the heterozygous are gonna have some um, 
somewhat resistant, and then the, uh, those who have sickle cell anemia are going to die, uh, could die. Uh, this, that's it for our first portion of speciation. We'll continue um, this discussion in the second part.